The first panelist uh, who's going to address this part of this panel on consent is Emmanuel Gaillard. Um, for those in the arbitration world, he needs no introduction. Uh, Emmanuel founded and heads Sherman Sterling's international arbitration practice. Uh, he's also the firm's global head of disputes. Uh, a professor of law in France. Uh, he serves as a visiting professor of law at the Yale Law School and also at Harvard Law School. Uh, Emmanuel has advised and represented companies, uh, states and state-owned entities uh, in hundreds of international arbitrations. Uh, he also acts as an arbitrator and as an expert witness. So with that very brief introduction, and I could go on much longer than that, um, I will then turn to Manuel, whose presentation will focus on first the issue of consent in international arbitration generally, uh, secondly, consent to arbitrate human rights at sea disputes, and thirdly, uh, the issue of transparency. Manuel, I'll leave you take the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. I have the the honor to discuss this very difficult topic, the consent requirement in human rights at sea arbitration. And before that, I want to say, uh, as global head of the firm and head of um, global head of uh, international arbitration at Sherman and Serling, uh, that it is a great honor to have been selected uh, to work on this project. It's a fascinating project. Everything has to be done. And if you compare it with more familiar territory for those who do international arbitration, it's like being in 65 or before 65 at the time of the negotiation of the exit convention uh, as far as um, uh, arbitration of, of investment dispute uh, is concerned. Everything needs to be done. Uh, even if there are more general models, but as far as human rights at sea uh, is concerned, everything is to be done and the situation is really, um, is really one which, which needs a lot of attention, even if, as we have seen uh, with, uh, the, uh, with the presentation of uh, Eric uh, Dawiki, uh, there is uh, also appetite, like in Dominica, uh, for, uh, to do the right thing. But, but there is also a lot, a lot to be done. So we want to thank David, David Hammond again for having uh, invited us to, uh, to, to think about this uh, topic. And consent is key because the rules are easy. I mean, I, to simplify, they are easy. And uh, I'm, I'm still at the introduction. But the, the rules are easy. It's, it's, um, you can develop the rules or you can simply refer to the general rules uh, and si or simply say it's the normal human rights, uh, rights which apply at sea. And what's difficult is to find the judge who will give a binding decision, a binding award, to the victim and the victims because the laws are different the, the, there are so many possible applicable laws so many applicable places where you could litigate it's very difficult and there is no awareness so what we would like to do is to raise the awareness and to couple a set of rules substantive rules, not just applicable law approach, substantive rules, which protect the victims with access to arbitration. And for that, you need consent. And because uh, you need consent, it's a very, very difficult topic. So I will, um, I, will de I will divide my presentation in two parts. One is consent in general, just to give the framework which can be used uh, in the field of human rights at sea, and then try to apply these general rules uh, to our possible models to the human rights at sea. So first, the, the consent 
in arbitration. Yes, uh, it's tried to say that arbitration is based on consent without consent possibly, uh, at least that was the old view. With no consent, you do not have arbitration. Arbitration is by, by based on consent, two parties or more consented to have their future or existing disputes to be resolved through arbitration. It's based on, on an agreement, an agreement to arbitrate and consent is the cornerstone, the foundation of arbitration. This is like very uh, trite. It's true uh, in commercial arbitration, and it's true, as we see on the next slide, also in investment arbitration in 65, when they adopted the exit convention, the drafters uh, used this word, the consent is the cornerstone of the jurisdiction uh, to jurisdiction to exit arbitration. That's, uh, that's obvious, but it needs to be said that at the same time, consent is probably one of the most difficult topics in international arbitration. There are many different topi difficult topics, but this one is probably, certainly in my ranking, uh, the most difficult one. You have issues of uh, degree of certainty of consent, uh, in many jurisdictions, you need a clear intention to settle the dispute through arbitration. Um, you uh, do not necessarily need to give this intention in a single document, as we see in the next slide. It can be through your conduct. It's accepted that conduct can evidence consent. If you have knowledge of a certain document with an arbitration, close in it, and then you perform the obligations under this agreement, you may have consented or certain jurisdictions do accept that this is an expression of consent. You accept by performing, say, general conditions of sales, you may accept the arbitration offer, which is in such general conditions of sales, for instance. Now, there is also possibly a requirement of consent in writing, at least to benefit from the New York Convention. You have a need to have a, an agreement to arbitrate in writing, although this is a loose requirement and in writing doesn't have to be a single instrument. It can be, it can be an email, it can be an answer, an offer in an email, the acceptance in another email, and that's consent in writing but to benefit from the New York Convention, and that would be one of the great advantages of the project, because if you have the benefit of the New York Convention, if the decision rendered in favor of a victim of a human right abuse at sea is an arbitral award, then it will be enforceable in most jurisdictions in the world. So that's one of the uh, big benefits. Uh, of, um, of arbitration, but you need to have consent in the first place, consent to arbitrate and possibly consent in writing. Now the next slide, and this is a very important one, is to flag the idea that often consent is given by both parties in a single instrument. You have two parties, the seller, the buyer, and they agree to arbitrate their disputes. But in investment arbitration, because of the work of the World Bank, we know now that consent can be given in different instruments. And that's what has made invest its investment arbitration uh, very important. Um, the consent can be given by the state in a law. You can say, I will protect investors if they qualify under this law. And there is substantive protection. And it's coupled with an agreement given to a class of investors, those who qualify under this law, to arbitrate with them if they say, if they claim rightly or wrongly, that, they are, uh, that this, their protection under this instrument has been violated. And it can also be given in treaties, bilateral investment treaties or multilateral investment treaties in laws, investment treaties, bilateral and multilateral. In all of these situations, the consent to arbitrate is given to a class of investors 
and in advance, and that's the offer to arbitrate. Then the acceptance is given after the fact, the investor is expropriated, there is a dispute, the investor is unhappy, and the investor discovers the existence of this advanced consent given by the state and say, yes, I accept the consent now, I will, I will seize an international tribunal. And that's a very important model for us, uh, this dissociated consent and this model, which is the one I mentioned before, which is to couple substantive protection, the treaties do offer the protection, and they couple the substantive protection with an offer to arbitrate, which can be accepted or not by the victim later. So that's, uh, that's the model which I think is the most topical for us. Now, you also have example uh, in my next slide of forced consent, and that's sport arbitration. But in sport arbitration, uh, yes, there is consent. Uh, the uh, athlete has consented um, to arbitrate uh, before the CAS tribunal. Um, it's an arbitration system, but the athlete has no choice. If they want to participate in the games, they have to consent, but it's a sort of theoretical type of consent. Um, it, they have no choice, really. Uh, but it still qualify as arbitration. They still consent, they have consented, and uh, then the result does qualify under the New York Convention as an award which can be enforced uh, worldwide under the New York Convention. Now, this is to be contrasted with mandatory arbitration. In certain states, Chile uh, is the, the, the state which is the most advanced in this. In Chile, they have uh, said that certain issues, um, including family law aspects of uh, certain disputes, uh, can be uh, or have to be resolved through arbitration. And here we are in the territory of mandatory arbitration. A law can say this type of dispute will be arbitrated. That's another model, which is a bit more dangerous for us because it's not clear whether mandatory arbitration is still an arbitration uh, because to qualify under the New York Convention, you need, you need consent or the agreement to arbitrate. So forced uh, agreement to arbitrate may not qualify, but certainly if it's mandatory, uh, it will raise uh, issues. So that's the background against which, which we are working after having uh, taken stock of the fact, as uh, Gabriel Kaufman and Thomas Schulz uh, reminded us that the classic uh, concept of arbitration based on consent today has evolved and it may not be completely true in every type of arbitration. So there is room for evolution. And against that background, I will now uh, quickly address the question of whether uh, we can secure consent uh, to, uh, to, to enable victims of human rights abuses uh, at sea to access uh, a proper arbitral uh, tribunal who will be able to render an enforceable award, enforceable uh, pretty much on a worldwide uh, basis. And that's the, one of the challenges of this work, uh, which needs to be uh, further uh, fleshed out, of course. Um, and it's clear that the choice here in this type of issue, human rights abuses at sea and, and the remedies, will have to be a victim-centered approach. Um, and it means, it means we can emulate what happened in the field of investment arbitration, have the players who should refrain from abuses or should police abuses and could be responsible for not having done so to commit not only to substantive rules, but also to commit to arbitrate disputes in case someone says, 
after the fact that they have not respected these substantive rules. So it should be a victim-centered approach. The victim can or can, can accept the offer to arbitrate or not, if they have a better, uh, a better remedy in, in, in a better jurisdiction, which may or may not exist, uh, then the victim has a choice. It's a victim-centered approach. It would be a choice. And the offer to arbitrate has to be given in advance. And then the victim can accept or not. And of course, the difficulty to secure advanced consent is to cover what uh, is generally uh, captured as, um, as human rights uh, abuses uh, at sea uh, is difficult because we have given in the next slide just an example, the workers uh, really thinks of that situation, uh, workers, uh, uh, seafarers uh, working like slaves and, and the like. There are abuses and, and we all know that. Now, the difficulty really, and this slide is also important, is that the type of abuses may be very diverse and the perpetrators may be diverse. So the key is to identify a typology of uh, cases, and this is simply uh, just a few examples. The victim may be abused by the crew, can they sue the crew or another other individuals. It may be hard to secure consent from these individuals, but, but that's typically a, a possible type of dispute. Uh, it's easy to understand a rape or, or anything um, of that nature in, uh, in a ship. Uh, now, the victim may also have a grievance vis-a-vis uh, -vis the company employing the crew in question, vis-a-vis -vis the fishing company, the shipping company, the employer, for not having policed the attitude of uh, the crew in question. Which, And there it may be a bit easier to identify who should be targeted as having given advanced consent to respect certain norms and to offer to arbitrate after the fact if there is a claim that these norms have not been respected. The victim similarly may want to uh, sue the ship owner or the charters, and it's true that one difficulty we are facing is that there are many players, many flags, many uh, possible applicable laws, and, and certainly a multiplicity of, uh, of uh, participants who should all ideally uh, have consented uh, in the, if we want the system to be, to arbitrate future disputes, if we want the system to be uh, efficient. Now, of course, a victim, and that's a candidate, a victim can have a grievance uh, against uh, a flag state, and it's very uh, comforting to see that some flag states want to uh, give the right example. Um, uh, and, and as opposed to others who, who want to simply be the, the easiest and the cheapest and the least uh, regarding as far as, um, as far as human rights is concerned, simply to attract as many, as many um, customers uh, as possible. Now, the port state may be involved for not having done certain things. You can think of uh, situations where they, they go, they inspect, they inspect, they look for drugs, and they don't care only about drugs. They see slave, slavery situation, but they don't care. They turn a blind eye on this situation, and that may be something which can be uh, the basis of a claim from the victims against, against them. And in, in more marginal situation, possibly the coastal state may have uh, some, something uh, against them as well. But this is not meant to be exhaustive. This is simply to show that we are talking about a multiplicity of situations and ideally a charter with substantive rights, the pledge to respect human rights at sea has to be coupled with consent given by all of these categories 
or at least the, as many uh, as possible of these categories of uh, players. Now, how to secure that? Uh, that's uh, that's uh, what uh, I say in the next slide. Uh, it's it's always the same thing. It's you can you can try to secure um, to secure the consent uh, afterwards by, as I say in yet the next slide, incentives or punishment. Uh, shaming and naming is, is one way. Uh, incentivizing is the other. I mean, there are no, it's simple enough. You have to put pressure and pressure can be through a reward of setting the, the, the tone, doing the right thing or, um, or uh, by punishing those who do not uh, behave. And this can be direct or indirect pressure. Um, a lot of progress has been made in the combat against corruption, for instance, through international uh, treaties and, uh, and, and a great uh, multilateral um, activity, putting pressure on states who still have secrecy jurisdiction and now they are closing down, uh, many states have, were very uh, lenient about um, you know, the beneficial owners of certain accounts, and now they, they cooperate internationally uh, to, to disclose the ultimate beneficial owner. And this has been achieved through uh, international pressure on certain jurisdictions by the main players. And we can see something uh, similar here through international activity or uh, pressure from other states, from intergovernmental organizations. Of course, NGOs have a huge role to play uh, as they have done in investment arbitration to shape and to modify the shape of uh, the system. Uh, here, it's a huge uh, field where the states can be, if they don't do the right thing uh, spontaneously, like Dominica, uh, to set to set the right uh, example, they can be named and shamed. But also, incentives can come from uh, banks who will finance certain activities. Maybe the financing can be conditioned, can be can be conditional to the. Um, uh, acceptance uh, of, uh, to, of a pledge uh, to respect human rights and consent to arbitrate. And, and that can be, so the banks can have a very important uh, role to play here. Flag states, of course, can condition their, uh, the access to their uh, registries uh, easily and that's uh, it can be done in a law it can be done simply in a document to have to fill a document to qualify to get the flag you want to get my flag fine you have to come to you have to pay certain fees but you also have to fill in a form which says that you will respect human rights and 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 that's the big progress you will accept to arbitrate disputes in a, a specialized system or not um, you will offer, you will consent to arbitrate to the benefit of the victims and later on the victims can, um, can uh, sue you and you accept in advance uh, to be sued in arbitration for allegations of uh, human rights uh, abuses. Um, and uh, so there are lots of different uh, possibilities. Uh, the states could also theoretically uh, condition access to their ports uh, to the same pledge. Uh, you see, so we, are, uh, we have seen examples in sport arbitration and certainly in investment arbitration where the consent is given, but the consent is given uh, because of certain pressure. In investment arbitration, I consent uh, to be sued because I want to attract investment. In sport arbitration, I consent to take all the dispute to CAS because I want uh, to participate in the race. 
um, it's here one would have to develop incentives and that's uh, that's one of the purposes of this uh, discussion to secure uh, consent to arbitrate coupled with um, coupled with uh, substantive protection and my last slide is simply meant to insist on the fact that any regime which we will um, uh, develop has to have, in my view, a uh, transparency feature. Of course, traditional commercial arbitration has um, secrecy, uh, if you speak like an NGO, or uh, confidentiality, if you speak as a business person, uh, features. And it can be legitimate if two, two, two players uh, want to resolve their disputes uh, without having their, say, customers aware of what they are disputing as to the, 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 the building of the product or whatever, uh, it, it's fine. But here, there is a strong public interest in the resolution of human rights disputes at sea and everywhere. And this strongly militates in favor of having transparency, having information about how those disputes are um, resolved. And that's what we think that the default position has to be uh, transparency. Of course, here, because it's a victim-centered um, system, you could also say that the victim has the option to keep it confidential. That may be their preference. They may not want to expose their weaknesses or what happened exactly depending on the situation. And in that case, you can make it optional, but I think certainly on the side of um, the respondent, uh, the consent to make it transparent has to be given in advance. So, so that, that's one of the features uh, to specific uh, mechanism for the resolution of human rights abuses uh, at sea. Uh, and uh, it's a much broader topic, uh, how to, 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 to shape the system. Uh, and, but transparency certainly is one of the feature and consent can be given through the different uh, ways. Uh, I have a canvas, so my, my, my a strong uh, view here is that the system will be effective only when we will be able to couple substantive protection and consent to arbitrate, an advanced consent to arbitrate given by a broad category of players. And then the task will be to devise uh, something which is workable and then which would have a broad uh, broad, uh, cons uh, broad adoption uh, uh, through um, the, the, the desire to do the right thing or simply the obligation to do the right thing uh, because of banking and, uh, and state pressures of, of different kinds. So this, this was the, the ideas I wanted to uh, develop for the beginning of this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you, Manuel, very much uh, for that uh, uh, thoughtful and erudite uh, discussion uh, of the issue of consent uh, in international arbitration and, and how it will apply or arise uh, in the context, the civic context of human, uh, human rights abuses at sea arbitration. Uh, and I'm sure we all uh, share your excitement uh, at the inception of this, and I was interested in your analogy with the ICSID Convention.